what a way to really start this morning. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful day, sunny and bright, and the willingness of God to bless his children is even greater than ever. Hallelujah. We have finished our fast. One week has passed. Some are still pressing on. Some are still really, uh, God asked some people to continue. They are continuing, which is good. Um, many of us are still trying to really um, recover. Um, with some of us, the fire is still burning. We need to keep fanning it into flames. Uh, higher flames, I mean. I mean, like, it's, it's, it has to really go a little bit higher. And for others, I know that the devil is trying to steal our joy. But let us not give him any room to operate. Amen. So this morning, I'm going to, I'm here to really encourage you, and we're going to look at, this is mid-year, we started from somewhere, we are uh, in, at the middle of the journey, and we need to press on till the end of the year, and we all know that this is a year of growth, so my question is, um, where are you? Are you growing? Amen. Are you growing? Or you are not growing? It's a question you need to really answer. Hallelujah. I don't know where you started this year uh, from, I mean, like, but I can say that there are some genuinely, I believe, had made progress. There are others, maybe, who have stagnated, yet there are others that probably have lost ground. Now, the question is that, where are you? Are you among those who have made progress? And you still desire to make more progress? Have you stagnated? Like you're trying to push, but it looks like you are not pushing or you are not making any progress. And at the stage of stagnation, there's a little bit more we, we may want to talk about. And the other... One is, is going back. Is pe some are losing ground. The kind of joy they started the year, they are not at the same place. The way they really started the year, where they began, they probably might have gone back a little bit. They need to really rise up and push uh, and move on. So, we, we may not all be at the same place, but there is one interesting thing that we can look at. Do you realize that <laughs> where someone has progressed to could be someone's stagnation point? And where someone has fallen to could be someone's beginning point. Let me, three people, right? I just need three people. Come, three people. So you stand here. So this is your starting point. Not just, yeah. This is your starting point. This is your starting point. And this is your starting point. Amen. Amen. So at the beginning of the year, the are uh, at this place. Now, this one in the course of the year got here. 
Has he made progress? Has he fallen back? But even his falling back is someone's and even that is falling back is still better than someone's. Do you understand? And this one come this way might have made the progress and got into this point. She's excited that she's growing. She's making progress. But her progress if compared to this one it's just stagnating. She's not going anywhere. In as much as she's made an effort and she's come, it's somebody's stagnation point. And again, it is somebody's really falling. So the, the, the truth is that this one shouldn't be too excited that he's gotten here. Although it's good that she's gotten here. But there is a OB. It's somebody's starting point. And it's somebody's place of uh, falling back. So if this one is not careful, she would be too excited and would not make any progress again. Because she thinks that, yeah, but I've made progress. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you compliment me? Wouldn't you clap for me? Yes, I will clap for you. But there is so, so much more to cover. Hallelujah. There is still so much more. Look, you are going to the wall. Look at where you are. Yes, indeed, we need to encourage you. We need to really compliment you. We need to clap for you that you've done well. But that should not keep you here. Hallelujah. You come. This one has moved here. Has she made progress? But look at where we're going. Look at where we're going. She might have made some progress, which is excellent. Let's clap for her. But don't be too happy you are here. There is still more ground to cover. And indeed, one other thing she needs to even ask herself, at what pace did I get here? And is, it, is there a possibility that I can increase this pace so that instead of my next half, I mean the next six months, instead of going at the same pace and getting here, I could increase my pace and double it up. <laughs> Hallelujah. But sometimes... When we begin to clap for her, she gets stagnated again. Or she even falls back. But this one has fallen back. Is it a good thing? But she's not lying on the floor. She's still somewhere. He's even, I mean, it's, it, he's falling back in somebody's progress. So it's not too bad. But we don't have to really bring him down. We don't also have to really say things to make him feel that, oh yeah, but it's somebody's she's progress, so then that's also good. No. We need to let him understand that you've fallen down. But don't stay here. You can still push. Hallelujah. Sit down. Look at yourself. What brought me back here? I thought I progressed from here. I thought I've gone forward. Why did I come back here? What went wrong? What did I do wrong? What, what did I not pay attention to? Was I too complacent when I was here? Because stagnation is dangerous. If you stay at one place for too long a time, the likelihood that you're going to fall back is great. So maybe he stayed here for too long and was complacent. So the reason he got here could be a lot of things. But do we have time to go into all this morning? No. But the question is, you must ask yourself, where are you? Where are you? It doesn't matter where you are. 
you could be progressing, retrogressing, stagnating, whatever it is. Are you there? So what do you have to do? Press on. Press on. Yes, Beloved in the Lord, this morning, I'm here to encourage you to press on. I'm here to let you know that regardless of where you are, whether you are stagnating, whether you are retrogressing, whether you are progressing, wherever you are, beloved in the Lord, there is room for you to improve. And therefore, you ought to rise up and press on. We cannot as Christians stay where we are. This is not new to you. But I agree with Paul in Philippians chapter 3 verse 1. Hallelujah. What did he say? He said, further... My brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. It is no trouble for me to repeat what I have told you before. Why? Because it's a safeguard for you. It will help you to begin to think about the second half of the year. What did Peter say? Hallelujah. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, or verse 12. So I will always, not sometimes, you know, some, there are people that need to be reminded always. So he said, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. Peter said, I ought to really keep reminding you. I have to really bring you to, even though you know it, it's not like you don't know. It's not like, and everyone needs to refresh himself. That's why at your workplace you do refresher courses. Hallelujah. A refresher course doesn't mean that you don't know the thing. It means that what you know, you need to refresh your mind. Because if you don't, you become still. If you don't do that, what happens is that there are times we think, and and like like what I showed you, you know, there are times people think that they've, they've really gone so far. And I don't begrudge you. Yes, it's not easy to make a step in the Lord. Take just one step in the Lord. It's not easy. Because every step you're trying to make, the devil is trying to take you back. You're fighting with a spirit you cannot see. You're fighting with a spirit that is always seeking to bring you back. He's really battling with you fighting strongly, trying to make sure that you don't make any progress at all. He's trying to bring you down. That's why, you know, I know, and I, without a shadow of doubt, that many of us sometimes look at ourselves and we ask, us, can we continue this journey? Can we? Because we've come to a point where we think that we are making the effort but we are not making progress. Hallelujah. Yes, it is good to make the effort, but your strength will fail you. My strength will fail me. If we can do it, we don't need God. If we can do it, Jesus would not have sent the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Something has to be done. Let 
Someone would have to rise up. Someone would have to really tell himself that all is not lost. Even though I've gone back. We give up too easily. We throw our hands in the air so easily. Why? Because the journey is tough. Beloved, indeed it is difficult and tough. And that is why Jesus did not leave us as orphans. He knows that there will be a time where you will be weak. There will be a time where you'll need someone to hold your hands. The battle could be intense. And in the intensity of the battle, that is not when you put your hands down. Those are the moments you keep your hands up. But to tell you the truth, those are the times your hands cannot be raised if even you want to. Have you been in a place where you feel so weak and you know you need to pray, but you can't pray? You look at yourself and you know what must be done, but you can't do it. And you need somebody to intercede for you. Some of us are at that place. Be bold and seek for that help. Moses knew that the only way the Israelites can win that battle was his hands to be kept up. But he was so weak he couldn't keep them up. He needed people to keep those hands up. You need someone to help you to keep your hands up. Where you have gotten in life, where you have gotten to, you need the Holy Spirit's help. You cannot neglect him and progress. It's impossible. I say it's impossible. Beloved, the one thing that can really destroy a Christian is when he feels he can do it by himself. If you get to that point, and if you are at that point, beloved, my advice to you is to rise up. Confess that it's a sin. Confess it to God and ask him for help. Because that's what you need. Hallelujah. I come back to my question. We all set ourselves up to grow this year. Where are you? If you begin to assess yourself, what would you say about yourself? Where are you? Growing? Falling back? Or you have stagnated? Where are you? If you don't ask yourself that question, you may not even know where you are. 
I'm telling you, you may not even know where you are. Because some of us indeed do not know where we are. When you began this year, how much of the Bible did you have in you and you were willing to get in a day or in a week? What were you doing? What did you plan to do? And where are you now? In your prayer life, how were you doing in your prayer life at the beginning of the year? Are you progressing? Are you going down? Or are you at the same place? Where are you? It is dangerous for a student to go to school and never be tested. Because that student will not know where he or she is. Where are you? You need to assess yourself. Very important. And after you've done that, you probably might see where you are. We said to ourselves at the beginning of the year we wanted to develop our faith, unity in the faith. We also said that we wanted to have a deeper knowledge of the Son of God, having knowledge in the Word. We also told ourselves that we have to mature as children of God. Mature to what? To attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The fourth part alone tells me that we've not arrived. Who has attained to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ here? We are not there. And yes, indeed, we are not there. But how much progress, how much ground have we covered? Many are measuring their success by maybe something they have gotten, some money they've gotten. That's good. How is Jesus assessing us? Based on how much money you have? Where have you grown your faith to this year? As a child of God, who really set out this year to grow his faith? Where are you? You have questions to answer. How has been your commitment to God this year? How much of your time have you committed to God this year? Has he become your priority? Is he indeed your priority? On a scale of 1 to 10, where is God? 
Where is he? Is he your number one priority or number ten? Or he's in the middle there somewhere. If he's not number one, beloved in the Lord, there's a problem. Because you don't set the standard and I don't set the standard. He does. And the one who has set the standard says in Matthew 6.33 that seek me first. I'm the priority. I am. That's why he's called I am. Hallelujah. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. The things and God. The things and the kingdom and the righteousness. Which one is number one for you? What is your priority? Is it the things? Or his kingdom? Are we here? I can see you, but I can't feel you. So I need to check. Maybe this is not why you came to church. (laughs) Why are you here? You can chew it. (laughs) But don't choke. (laughs) Please don't choke. (laughs) Yeah. I, I don't I don't know whether you know how much he loves you. I don't know whether you know how much he cares about your life. Do you realize that the enemy does not want you to know how much he loves you? And do you know what he does? He points to things. And he shows you on a regular basis what you are missing. The more you get closer to God the more he's trying to show you what you are not achieving. Not in the Lord, but in the world. When Jesus is asking you to seek him first, he's telling you something else. These were not words of, a, of another prophet. These are words of Jesus Christ. How many of us are seeking the kingdom first? When you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing on your heart? If it's not about Jesus, there's a question mark. When you get up from your bed, what's the first thing you think of? To check your mails? To check what was up? To go on Facebook? 
Right, what does your mother do? <laughs> There's confusion there. Mother and daughter. I don't want to know. It's enough. The conversation is enough. I can feel it already. Hallelujah. When you wake up, what's your f- what's the first thing in your mind? <laughs> Let's get this right. When are you supposed to get to work? Okay, so when, you, when do you leave home? Six twenty and six forty. Okay, all right, that's fine. You can sit down. Now, she has to leave home between six twenty and six forty. Good. So, when do you normally wake up? Four thirty. Okay. And when you wake up, what do you do? When I wake up, I prepare hot water and prepare the food. <coughs> Should I go ahead? I prepare, I prepare hot water. <coughs> mm-hmm. I prepare hot water for bathroom. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and then I prepare breakfast. Mm-hmm. And then I get them to get ready. I wake them up. Wake my children up and wake them up. And then we get ready and we go. Did you hear God? Where is he between 4.30 and 6.40? I start with him after I come out of the room. Hmm. But you didn't say anything about him. So when do you come out of the room? Quarter to five. Okay, so 15 minutes with him. Okay, all right, that's fine. So 4.30, 15 minutes with him, and then the rest. All right, that's good. What about if you wake up at 5 a.m.? Where will God be on the list if you wake up at 5 a.m. instead of 4.30? Okay, thank you very much. A lawyer at the court will say, I rest my case. (laughs) This is where the problem is. When he has time, she has time. God has 15 minutes. When she wakes up late, God has zero. Let me meet her on the street. What's your number one priority? What answer will you give to me? What's your number one priority? Work. Okay, all right. You've answered well. (laughs) She said work. Work. But if we were not in church, what would she say? And if we have not gone through what we have gone through right now, what do you think she will say? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Look, this morning is a wake-up call. I just want you to wake up from your slumber. 
and don't be late. <laughs> I like that. No, listen. Yeah, but you are late today. <laughs> Amen. When, when you don't like what you are hearing, you turn it into tongues, chi, Greek, or Latin. <laughs> Amen. No, you can sit down. Listen, this, this is the reality. I want us to do a reality check. Because, you know, we have to come to that place when we begin to look at everything all over again. There's work to be done, I'm telling you. There's a scripture in the Bible that really scares me. Maybe not scary, but concern. But I think it's a little bit scary as well. Of these guys who... On the last day, Jesus said, Mm-mm, go this way. They challenged him. He said, no, that's not our place. We did A, B, C, D for you. Fine. You sure it was for me? <laughs> he didn't say, I don't know you. He said, I never knew you. So when we were doing it, who are we doing it for? And you remember Zachariah? Chapter 7? You've been fasting. Yeah, yeah. Should we go on fasting? He said, for all those years, the 70 years, who are you fasting for? Me? There's a there's a tree song. I don't really remember. Probably it's it says something like na baby Sami say something something. I don't I don't I mean like it's it's more like Mimpese Meba Wenim na baby Sami say Edien Amiye or something. Exactly that song. Mm-hmm. Sing it for me. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Are you, are you, do you hear the words yourself? Amen. We don't sing that again. All that God is, I mean, that song is saying is, um, I don't want to come and stand before you And then you say that, get away from me, I never knew you. So fill me, strengthen me, so I can serve you well. Regardless of what you have done, you still need him to strengthen you so you can do more. We've come to a place in this walk with the Lord that Christians don't do this anymore. We don't check. We're just moving on. We're just going. Some think we are going, but we're going back. Some things we move, some, some of us think that we are moving, but we are so stagnated, we're not making any progress. Since you came to Christ, that's too long ago. Since January to July. Where are you? Right. 
Maybe you wanted me to preach on something that will excite you. Which I can. But the truth of the matter is, what about if the excitement dies down? What about that? And it comes to the reality, you and Jesus. Do you know that people dance in church and go back home and cry? They jump around, but they go home and cry. I don't want you to jump in church and go home and cry. Listen to me carefully. What determines your really walk with the Lord and your relationship with Him is how much of your time you spend with Him to know Him more. Because that will define the rest of the things you do. For some of us, do you realize that we are only really maybe like serious Christians when we are in the midst of other people? But when we are all by ourselves, everything we go through is pain. Do you realize that some of us don't know Christ for ourselves? Do you realize that some of us, we only know God by what, what someone has said? Because the pastor said A, B, and C, that's what we know about God. But you and him, if he asks you, you remember Jesus had this chat with his disciples. Who do people say? Oh, yeah. Do you know how quick they were answering? When he came to the reality, what about you? What about you? You, you, what about you? If he's standing in front of you right now and asking you, what would you say? He only answered by revelation. If he doesn't, if he's not revealed to you, you can know him. And you have to have a relationship with him for him to be revealed to you. I'm tired of measuring our Christianity by how many air conditions we have. By how many cars we have. But how well we can dress. How many buildings we have put up. If that is your measure, the world is forever better than you. There are more buildings than we have. Amen. Amen.
Jesus says something. Let me, let me quickly give that to you. And measure that by how you live, how, how you see life today. Amen. It's a very simple, straightforward scripture. Because if we don't pay attention, what is going to happen is that what is going to happen is that we're going to really keep following what he doesn't want us to follow. Unfortunately, we don't understand. Hmm. Do we? Where do you stand? I just want to know where you stand. How do you measure your success in the Lord? Can you tell me this morning? Hmm? Can you? Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 says something. But that's not what I, I, I want you, I, I want you to look at that. No one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other or you will, love, you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But let's hear what Luke said. Luke chapter 12, 15. Then he said to them, and this is Jesus, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Life, even if life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions, how much more faith? Your Christianity is not measured by how much you've made in terms of physical things. Because Jesus said, our life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. And just as he said that, the next verse, look at what he said in the next verse. And he told them this parable. Listen to me carefully. Just after he defined, I mean, or he explained what life is not. He said, and he told them this parable. And this parable is to really help us to understand what he was saying in the previous verse. It's not long, so move on. Oh, please, (laughs) let me read the second part before we move on. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. What? What? The previous verse is what? Life does not consist. What word is recurring? Okay. 18. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. 
Tell me this morning, what is sinful about this? Is it a sin? It's not. Amen. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid out for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I've got my money. I've made my investments. I go on an early retirement and decide to enjoy my wealth. What has that got to do with your pastor? Don't I come to church? Okay, let's go. But God said to him, Say it in God. Say it in a way. A way. You what? Say that one in a way. Huh? Who made Dagati. Huh? Damboru. Portuguese. Talise. Hallelujah. Where do you come from? You don't know. Okay. Who will take this girl to her hometown for me? How do you say it in Adan or Krobo? Huh? Obiewa. Tolisi. Obiewa. Oluwa. What did you say? Oluwa. What? Tambourine. (laughs) And let's all together say it in English. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Another fool. Beloved, is it wrong to make money? No. But your life does not consist in the abundance of what you are running after. Stop measuring yourself. Your, because now, many of us Christians, we measuring ourselves by how much money we have been able to make, how much buildings we've built, how much... Can I say that on you? But watch out. I've said that. Is that a sin? Okay. So then I can say the next one. (laughs) How much members we have. The members. No. Listen to me carefully. Don't, don't, Don't take offense. But listen to me. For some of us, our measure of success as a ministry depends on the abundance of the people. Still the word is. Hello. Not their quality, not how much the people know Christ. Yeah.
Yeah, because your church is small. That's not why I'm saying what I'm saying. It's what the Bible is saying. The success of a ministry is not dependent on the number of people. If that is so, Jesus failed. I said, if that is so, Jesus failed. After walking on earth as who he is, preaching, feeding five thousands, four thousands, preaching, doing everything. 120 were in the upper room waiting. 120. At one point, it was left with 12. Because the Bible says that everybody left. Does it mean Jesus has failed? No. He was left with a 12 that he could, yes, committed, devoted, that could be raised to win 3,000 in a day. You can have 10,000 that follow because of a meal. Because of the lights. Because of the name. Jesus said, listen to me carefully. Jesus said, they follow me because of the food they had. The fact that, listen to me carefully, Jesus is saying, the fact that I have 5,000 following me doesn't mean that these 5,000 believe in me and want to save me. They just want food to eat. Why are you in church? Why are you here this morning? Why are you here this morning? What brought you here? What brought you here this morning? Is it commitment? Or what? Do you know why some people get so offended in church? And when I was sick, nobody called me. So I'm angry. Yes, I'm angry. You people, you don't laugh. When I was sick, nobody, nobody called me. Nobody. You didn't care about me. Is that why you are here? For people to call you when you are sick. Not Jesus to heal you, but for people to call you when you are sick. Is that why you are here? You know, (laughs) (laughs) where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Are you progressing? Are you stagnating or are you going back? Where are you? What's going on in your mind this morning? In your walk with the Lord, where are you today? What is your endurance level? How are you willing? Two things. How are you willing to endure? Are you How much willing are you to endure to the end? In Hebrews chapter 12 verse, I think 2, Jesus, I mean, look at Jesus himself. Bible says that, let us fix our eyes on who? 
Facing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he did what? I thought he enjoyed the cross. He endured the cross, scorning its shame. Christians today are not able to scorn the shame. But people will say this about me. But people, let them say what they want to say. Press on. Let them say that you, are, you, you, are, you, you don't count anymore. You know, some people, when we come to Christ, Bible says are separate from them. You need to separate from some people. And because of the names they will call you, because they will call you names, you decide that, look, I need to hang out with them. Because of some, some little things you will enjoy from them. You look at that relationship as of more importance than Jesus. Bible says that the one we follow, the one we follow, the one who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, he endured the cross. Though it was painful, though it was tough, though it was difficult, before he went to the cross, he said he was filled with sorrow to the point of death. He, he, he cried to the Lord, this cup, this cup, this cup, let it, if it's possible, but, but whose will? Not your friend's will. Let us stop. Beloved, every one of us must stop today. Bam. And then this, just watch up him and then say to ourselves, Lord, I let everything go. Beloved, I can't say it any other way than to tell you that if anything becomes more important to you than Jesus, you are not worthy to be called a disciple. I'm not saying it. Jesus said it. Didn't he? He said, if you want to be my disciple, not sometimes. Today you follow. Tomorrow you don't follow. When he says daily, you choose. I said, when you want to follow. If it doesn't suit me today, Jesus, stay where you are. We all have some pressing on to do. We all do have some pressing on to do. I said regardless of what, where you are standing, the most dangerous thing, the three that were standing here, the most dangerous thing or the most dangerous position was Joseph's position. When you are falling, but because you're still looking at yourself better than somebody else because Esther was behind. You know, you come to church, you know you are falling, but because you every day you are able to come and somebody comes once a week, you still see yourself as better than that person. Don't measure yourself by that person. Bible says that those who measure themselves by themselves, they are not. Because I am standing here, even though I've fallen, I am still better than this one. So yes, even though I'm going back, I'm still okay. You are not okay. We grow. We don't go back. 
That's, that's your end point. This is it. Look at where you are standing. And instead of thinking about making progress, you're still comparing yourself with someone. And then telling yourself, comforting yourself, I'm still okay. The next time, you will be here. And because there's someone there, you think you are still okay. Then you come here, but you still see somebody behind you. So you think you are still okay. Until you realize that But that time might be too late. I said that time might be too late. Beloved, if you have any decision to make, make it today. Tomorrow might be too late. I am not saying you are not a Christian. But I I am saying that if you are a Christian and you are not growing, you have a problem. Let's stop those little, little things. Look, the size of your wardrobe doesn't impress me. It doesn't. Look, you can come to church with Chalawote. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't. Hallelujah. What is important is what are you doing with the Chalawote? Some people can sit at home and say that. Yeah, but you see, my shoe is old. So what? Who expects shoes in church? Who expects shoes in church? Yeah, but me, I have only one dress. And so what? Do wash and dry. Wash and wear or whatever you want. You wash it, you dry it, you wear it. Super. You can even do dry cleaning. It doesn't matter. The God you serve will provide. Let nothing stop you from pursuing Jesus Christ. Go after him. Follow him. Chase him up. Bible says that if you fall seven times, rise up. Don't stay on the floor. Don't stay down there. Who can tell me that since he became a believer, he's never sinned? Does it stop us from serving? Do we always have to really just uh, comfort ourselves and pamper ourselves that, yeah, because everybody sins? No! The sins you used to commit when you were one year old in the Lord, if you, after 10 years, you are committing the same sin. Question mark. Let's move on. Let's press on towards the goal. It is for a reason he purchased us with his blood. It is for a reason we were saved. We were not saved to sleep. We were saved to do the good works that was prepared for us before the foundations of the earth, before you became a Christian. God prepared something for you. God wants you to do something. Find it out. Keep pushing. Keep pressing. You may not have attained it. That's what Paul says. Let's go to, back to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to finish right now. But I'm just here this morning to let you understand that there is work to be done. Hallelujah. We have not arrived. I said we have not. So we keep pressing on. Hallelujah. Verse, verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider for the sake of Christ. Yes, I've made progress. But that progress doesn't define me. 
Because there is still more to be done. So, do I stop? I keep pressing on. He says that, go to the next verse. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Listen. I consider everything. Every kind of progress I have made. Every kind of victories I have won. Every success I have made. I consider all of them because there is something more important than that. Yes, you have healed 10 people. That's a blessing. You have filled the church. That's good. You have done this. That's good. But Jesus said to the disciples, when they came back and they said, we have healed people in your name. Demons bow down to us in your name. They said, don't be excited about that. Be happy. Be excited. Be joyful that your names are written in the book of life. That is more important as long as you are not there. Everything else. Paul says, I count it loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them I consider them I consider them dung. You know, you know dung let me add cow. I consider them. Listen. If you have, listen, you have not achieved a hundred of what Paul achieved, yet he calls it garbage, dung, trash, baller rubbish, whatever. It doesn't matter what you have achieved. Look, let's stop making the noise. Christian, ask yourself, have I achieved what Paul did? Yet he called it what? Dunk, trash, rubbish, garbage. Verse 9. That I may gain him and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is true faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Now, he gets to verse 10. He goes, I want to know Christ. Paul, are you saying you don't know him? But Paul says, I want to know Christ. Amen. Stop making yourself like you know him too much. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering. Becoming like him in his death. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. But verse 12 says that, not that I have already obtained all this, regardless of what I have done, regardless of what I have got into, regardless of the achievements I have as Paul, I don't regard myself that I have already obtained it all this, or I have already arrived at my goal. But I do what? But I do what? It doesn't matter whether I move from here to here. I still have some pressing on to do. It doesn't matter how long you fasted. You still have some pressing on to do. It doesn't matter what you have achieved, how many buildings you have built, how many money you have in your bank account. You still have some pressing on to do. It doesn't matter how many people you pray for and they get healed. You still have some pressing on to do. Joseph, come and die. Come, come. You keep dying. 
You die here. No, no, let him die here. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter that he fell from the window from this floor downstairs. And I went down. I held him and I brought him back to life. Sat him down and continued to preach. It doesn't matter what I did that. Paul had done that. Yet he says that I consider that garbage. Because knowing Christ is better than raising the dead. You can sing and so what? Dear Mauzo. This one is not dead. (laughs) But for Paul, that guy was dead. Bible says that they came to tell Paul, the guy who fell from the window is dead. He got down. He paused his preaching. He didn't stop. He paused. He went down. He looked at him. You can't die when I'm preaching. (laughs) So he held him. And he brought him up. He took him to the service. Sit in the front row. Now even if you die, I will raise you and preach again. (laughs) Hallelujah. Have you done that since you you came to Christ? Paul, who did that, says that I consider that. Because knowing Christ is greater than that. Having my name written in the book of life is greater than that. Jesus himself made us understand that there will be people coming to me. They raise the dead, but that doesn't really move me. They didn't know me. Let us stop. Beloved, I can't get you here and make, just make you feel good. You can feel good here and still make it to hell. My responsibility is not to make you feel good. My responsibility is to help you to know Christ. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Next verse. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself. Why is Paul repeating himself? I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. There's so much ahead of you. Stop really making noise about what you have achieved. It's okay, fine. God did it through you. I I love it. I praise God for it. Testimonies are good. But let's move on. There is still grounds to cover. We've come half of the year. Some have made progress, some have not, whatever, but it doesn't matter. Wherever we are, there's still grounds to cover. There's still six more months or five more months or whatever you want to call it. Hallelujah. He says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. 14. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. It's not about here. I said it's not about here. I said it's not about here. It's about heaven. It's about heaven. Your excuses are not counting in heaven. What shall it profit a man? If he gains the whole world. When was the last time you heard that scripture? We don't talk about it again. Because we are being made to understand that 
It is all to your profit when you gain the whole world. So every prayer is about your breakthrough. How much more money you can make. I'm not saying that's a sin. But I'm saying that don't allow that to take your attention. Don't allow it. Because life does not consist in the abundance of what you have. It's not. You may have everything, but you may lose your soul. When are we going to understand that? And stop chasing after the world when Jesus says that, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. The things you are taking, and, and he wasn't even talking about the things you are talking about. He was talking about the basic necessities of life. He was talking about shelter. He was talking about clothing. I mean, what we can just use to cover ourselves. And he was talking about um, food. Very basic things. Now, we have developed beyond that. We're talking about cars. We're talking about... For some people, their breakthrough is a new phone. <laughs> Somebody says, I've used Yam for far too long. I need what? They call it what? Touch. Touch what? They don't call it smartphone here. They call it touch screen. And now they've even taken away the screen as well. This is my new touch. And that is somebody's breakthrough. Every, every prayer meeting, what he's praying for is a touch. The unfortunate part is that he can't even test a message. He can't. He can't even read one line of the Bible. But he wants... All that you use the touch for, hello, something Yam can do. Why do you waste your money to buy a touch when you can save that money and buy a Yam? Go to school. Use the rest of the thing to go to night school and learn how to operate a touch. Then go and buy a touch. Because what you are holding is unnecessary. We have come very far. We have progressed. We've done something. But we've not arrived. We have not arrived. I said, we have not. And if we have not arrived, we don't stop the journey. If we have not arrived, we don't stop and sleep. We keep pressing on. We keep pushing forward. We keep going. There's so much ahead of us. The second half of the year, what is it that you want to do? What changes are you ready to make to go to the next level? What commitment are you ready to make? What sacrifice are you ready to make? Because if you don't sacrifice something, you cannot go to the next level. Something has to give way so that we can gain something. We have to let go of some things so we can be lighter to move on. There's too much baggage and we need to leave the baggage so we can progress. What is weighing you down? What is it that weighs you down? It is better to go 
go for him rather than for anything else. He says, come unto me, all And I'll do what? Some of us need rest. Beloved in the Lord, I don't know where you stand. I don't know. But I don't want you to be super happy with where you are. Because there's still a lot of ground to cover. be happy that when you prayed for someone he go well. It's okay. But there are many more sick. And there's still more that can be done. Let us go beyond where we are. I don't know what you want to tell God this morning for the next six months. Probably five and a half months. I don't know. Don't go to God this morning telling him I need a new car. Don't go to him telling him I need a promotion. Go to him with Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 at the back of your mind. God spoke to you at the beginning of the service. I don't have to pray any any more prayer. You have to go to him. You've heard him. What are you ready to tell him? What do you want to tell God this morning? Are you happy where you are? In your walk with the Lord. Are you happy? Hello? Are we happy? If we are not, what are we saying to him this morning? 